Um, hello and welcome to this session on um, editorial and commercial um, and what's changing in the current environment. I'm going to say a very uh, brief few words. Um, I'm Jane Martinson, I'm the head of media at The Guardian um, newspaper, I work in London. Um, I'm partly going to say brief a few words because I, um, my voice is fading, um, but mainly because I have an absolutely brilliant panel um, who can talk about this issue. Um, on a sort of global perspective. Um, I'm sure many of them need no introduction, um, as they've also all been working very hard um, at this festival. Um, on my immediate right is Felix Salmon, who writes about uh, media, finance, society, uh, lots of things. Um, now for Fusion, or since September for Fusion, a uh, multi-platform um, uh, venture. He's based in New York, previously at Reuters, and also writes the occasional column for The Guardian. I'm very pleased to say. To his right is Margaret Sullivan, um, the public editor of the New York Times, who's been described as a consistent voice of reason, which was my, yeah. that was my favorite quote. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Emmett, to her right, was editor-in-chief of The Economist for 13 years until 2006, and since then, he has written a book about Italy over the past 20 years and also done uh, two documentary films, but one about Italy, the other one about Europe. To his right is, and at the end, is George Brock, who is professor of journalism at City University in London and until last September was head of the Department of Journalism there. Prior to that, he was at the Times of London, latterly as a managing editor. So all of them have great um, knowledge and experience of the ethics of journalism. Um, the reason we decided this would be a really good um, topic to talk about in Perugia um, was because there were certain, sort of th this is becoming a global issue for the media. In uh, the UK earlier this year, an esteemed writer for the Daily Telegraph, Peter Oborn, resigned from that paper and accused it of committing a form of fraud on its readers um, because of what he said uh, was a sort of the advertising department or relationships with a massive advertiser such as HSBC dictating editorial policy, uh, meaning that they didn't run huge stories about alleged tax evasion. In recent weeks, we've had BuzzFeed uh, delete two posts um, which were critical of two advertisers, Dove and Hasbro. Within 24 hours, they put the posts back up. And I'd, I'd quite like to talk about the pressures of advertising, they've always been there, but it's been a hallmark of quality journalism that advertising and editorial are kept strictly apart. Is that still the case? And what can we do if those pressures are getting too great? Um, I'd like each of the panelists to uh, say a few words first, and then we'll have some questions, and I, I would like to open it up to the floor. Um, I do have to leave dead on four, so I shall get going uh, straight away. Um, can we, actually Felix, you start, and we'll go that way, and then we can sort of I'm talk. Sure. Wow, okay. I'm, I'm sure I'll think of something. So I, I don't, um, I'm not religious about this one. Um, I, I do think that it's simple common sense and good business for um, journalists to not be directly influenced by Advertisers, you can't have advertisers having sort of effective veto power over what appears in a publication that's crazy and as you know as um, And even the appearance of that as we saw at BuzzFeed is extremely damaging um, you know there are places like Vice where it where the um, lines start getting a bit blurry and I frankly have bigger things to worry about than like the blurriness of the lines at Vice um, I do think that it's very easy to, f to, to sort of seek out the moral high ground. And I think there are dangers associated with that. I think that historically what you've seen is that um, the publishing side, you, you've had these two different roles of the publisher and the editor, the, you know, the ad sales and the journalists. And the business side is the one bringing in the revenue and sort of being in charge of what's known these days as product and technology and audience and all of these things which are now very, very core to journalism. And one of the problems with walls is that um, there's a sort of suspicion of those uh, role 
talks within the newsroom because they're always considered to be you know the other side and often you find that the product people you know are much more comfortable talking to the business people than they are talking to the journalists and all of this is a problem so while there are very you know simple common sense things about like you know let's not let um, you know, important clients interfere with the journalism. Yes, we can all agree on that. I don't think it's a very interesting conversation. We can all agree on that. I, I think that in principle, let's, you know, let's try and um, integrate. And um, especially when it comes to things, Margaret and I disagree on the subject of conferences a bit. Um, you know, there's like, Tina Brown likes calling conferences live journalism, which I think is stretch. a stretch. <laughs> but they're, but they're important parts of a lot of media models these days. And I think that if you start getting, and, and you know, it's all part of this thing called access journalism, and there is a value to access journalism. If you have access to certain people who will tell you certain things, which no one, which they won't tell anyone else, that is a valuable thing, and it's a genuine part of journalism. And, you know, although it, you know, the, the sort of holier than now investigative types might sneer at it. There is an importance to it. There is value to it, especially in, in, in television. And again, with access journalism, yeah, no, there are deals involved. And let's not get hung up, I guess is my, my, man, my main message, but let's hear what everyone else has to say. No. That's impressive. How about that? Good. Um, well, I used to be the editor of a newspaper, uh, and as editor of the newspaper, I, I sometimes got phone calls from uh, my publisher who would say, I understand you're going to run a story about advertiser X, uh, you know, what's going on there? Um, and I would say, I will take a look at that, a special look at that. And I would take a special look at it, but I hope I didn't treat it any differently than I would a story about uh, uh, some organization or person who was not an advertiser. Um, so I, I say that just as a way of saying that this is not a new issue. I think the part that's very new is that um, media organizations are scrambling for revenue in a way that they never have before. And so, um, you know, we're t I think in many ways we're taking those traditional walls down if not taking them down altogether, sort of taking them down to a point where we can see each other and talk over the wall. And I actually think that's, that's fine. Um, you know, we all know what the problem is here. We don't want to be treating uh, business partners any differently than we would treat anybody else. So, you know, and these are issues that ha have come up at the two examples that, that Jane just spoke about. Um, I agree with Felix that we shouldn't um, be, you know, zealots about about keeping things so strictly defined that you know we can't do productive things and talk to each other. Um, at the New York Times, you know, there is more interaction now between the business side and the editorial side, I think, than there's ever been. I don't think there've been any ethical issues that have arisen, uh, uh, ethical problems that have arisen. Um, everybody's being pretty careful about it. One area where we're seeing this develop and where issues are coming up is around native advertising, which, you know, can be sort of seen as a way to baffle the reader or the viewer so that, you know, he or she thinks that uh, they're seeing editorial content when it's actually advertising. If, if the viewer or reader is in fact baffled and confused, then it's not being done right but I think it can be done right and, and not present a problem. So I guess my major message is it's fine to have these partnerships and it's fine to have these conversations, but we can't let go of the fact that our credibility is the thing that we've got. And if we lose that, you know, we're kind of really messed up. Um, Bill, you've looked at Italy, not just um, uh, writing about Berlusconi quite famously in 2001 at The mm -hmm. Economist, but in recent years looked at um, the, the, the uh, system here. Would you say that the, these sort of pressures with the commercial and editorial side are, are particularly different in Italy? Well, I think that um, actually Italy is a useful place to look at this issue from because I think that the Italian audience here will um, forgive me if I say that there is no such thing as independent journalism in Italy, uh, really. Um, the, uh, 
Il Fatto Quotidiano think that they are. Maybe they are because they are the only uh, mainstream publication that's as were not owned by a publisher, not owned by a, a proprietor. Um, but then uh, well, the, all of the others are either very politicized or very commercialized, or both, I would say. Um, now, obviously there are shades of gray. I write quite regularly for La Stampa, and of course I think it's the most... Uh, <laughs> beneficent and uh, wonderfully uh, moral paper in the world um, while they keep paying my fees. But the, uh, but the truth is that what this, I think, should focus our attention to is the reader. What does the reader expect? What does the reader think about what it is we're doing? Because if we look at uh, the question about, well, any media, basically media has always since uh, Adam and Eve, or since Gutenberg, rather, as uh, Jeff Jarvis reminded us, uh, 150 years since Gutenberg, when the first newspaper was invented, um, has always consisted of two transactions. One, a transaction with an advertiser, the other, a transaction with the reader. And no editor is doing their job properly if they don't recognize that there are two transactions taking place. And the question is about keep about the different promise that you're making to the two transactions. And the transaction with the reader, by the way, can be commercial or it may not be paid, but nevertheless it is a transaction about a promise that you're making to the reader. If we look at a fashion magazine, if we look at uh, Vogue or any other fashion magazine, my belief, probably as a non-reader of fashion magazines, is that the reader of a fashion magazine does not think that the editorial and the advertising are purely separate. They think that uh, Prada and everyone is, they're all in it together, but they don't mind because what they want is to see the latest fashions, they want to see the beautiful pictures, they want to see what's at the cutting edge and so on. Same with the travel magazine except I think there are shades of gray with travel. I think there is a uh, proposition to be made that you are the independent travel magazine. But you know, even in the Financial Times, a, a newspaper I respect enormously, I think it's a wonderful newspaper, all of their travel uh, articles have at the end, uh, such and such person went there as a guest of, and then a resort in uh, the Caribbean or in Italy or whatever it is. So is this independent journalism? No, it isn't, but it's transparent, and it's a question of what does the reader, what do the readers expect? So I think that the right question for any editor is what promise have I made to the reader? The New York Times says it's promising to put all the news that's fit to print. If it was just publishing all the news that advertisers thought was fit to print, then it would clearly be breaking its promise. Similarly, The Economist it goes on the basis of a promise about independence uh, and about credibility, but not all journalism is that, but the question is, what is the promise? And I would say with Italian papers uh, and Italian media, the reader is not expecting the same promise as the reader of The New York Times is expecting from, from The New York Times. My question to you, perhaps, is could they in the future, could the independent journalism model become attractive to, it, to Italian readers? Will Italian readers believe that the, the, what they're being told is independent because of you know, questions about truth and, uh, and independence and so on, or not? But I think that we have to not be pure about it, as Felix says, but we have to realize that there is a question of transparency of what is the promise that we're making to the reader. George, um, as someone who spent a long time at the Times, can you talk about, perhaps I'll start off your comments t talking about how shocking the allegations were against the Telegraph? Taking my cue from Jane, obviously this session began with the, I think I'm correct in calling him the chief political commentator of the Telegraph, resigning with a thunderous column in some other publication saying that the... Uh, relations between the paper and HSBC, the international bank, had allowed the bank to distort the paper's coverage of what it was doing. Now, since the session title also has 
never the twain shall meet. Can I start with a distinction? What was happening, we are fairly sure, in the HSBC Telegraph case, was not a problem about people meeting or communicating. This isn't mere pedantry, just bear with me. Because what it was, was the improper use of power. The commercial power being ill-advisedly, very ill-advisedly, probably used to distort the editorial message. But I do agree also with Richard Gingras of Google, who said very, uh, in a very lapidary style once, the era in which editorial and the other parts of the publishing operation can practice determined ignorance of each other is over. Because of what is going on in the digital era, it really is important for journalists to be able to communicate with other parts of whatever publishing business they're in. You cannot research, structure, add value without understanding what your readers and users want. And that will involve everybody getting together. But they have to do so under a series of rules which make sure that the power where it is available is not uh, misused. Obviously, in online, there are some new risks. There are risks because legacy publishers are desperate. That's probably the pressure that led the Telegraph to do what it did. There are obviously risks present in things like native advertising. It can be done okay, but it needs to be done under rules and so on. I kind of agree with the spirit of what Felix was saying just now. I think I'll just close with one last point. If there is coming pressure from advertisers, and since we are dealing a lot with smaller publishing operations and startups, don't forget that in this respect, size matters. If you are a large, well-established publisher, with plenty of revenue and resources, telling an advertiser who wants to try it on to go and get stuffed is a bit easier. Mm. Can I actually, what, what was interesting, Felix, is that you were the most gung-ho about how we shouldn't really worry about this. And you mentioned Vice, which has been incredibly controversial, actually, in, in blurring the lines. Um, Bill and also George touched on, and actually Margaret previously has touched on this issue of the reader and if the future is to be about integrity of the relationship, isn't that the most dangerous thing? Or is it that you are actually the one who has worked least on the old print media? <laughs> Lots of questions. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the integrity of the relationship with the reader is important, and maybe the way I look at Vice is not dissimilar to the way in which Bill looks at Vogue. And the... Um, you know, I don't think that most of Vice's readership is going to Vice for, you know, fearless independent journalism so much as they are because it's like, you know, cool and fun and and and, so, and, and that kind of thing. And so maybe that's why it doesn't bother me quite so much. Um, you know, this might change a bit as Vice gets deeper and deeper into the news business and it's just announced a big new deal with HBO and, and that kind of thing. So that, you know, I'm not saying that my opinion isn't going to change on this as Vice changes, but for the time being, I think, you know, a couple of little corners of the Vice empire notwithstanding, corners which I think um, journalists tend to magnify in their mind. Um, most of Vice is, is relatively, you know, it's not really a journalistic organization. Um, I would love to just touch on this issue of disclosure, though. I think it was very interesting how both Margaret and Bill talked about the sort of cleansing, um, ethically cleansing effects of disclosure, that, that um, na in Margaret's eyes, native advertising is fine, just as so long as it's clearly disclosed as such. And um, in Bill's eyes, um, travel trinkets are fine, just as long as they're clearly disclosed as such. I'm not sure, I don't think they're fine, but readers seem to accept <laughs> them, that's the basis. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, in, it's interesting to me because the New York Times famously um, fired one of its freelance contributors, Mike Elbow, for taking a travel junket, which was absolutely nothing to do with the New York Times. He was just a, um, you know, a freelancer who wrote an unrelated column for the New York Times, and because he wound up on a junket, you know, in his, you know, his other life, they, they, they canceled his column. And so there are very different views about 
that kind of behavior. And in general, I'm not a huge fan of the, well, we've disclosed it, so it's okay, um, out. I think that disclose, people don't see disclosures, they don't understand disclosures, they don't care about disclosures, and they really don't understand the degree to which uh, peace, you know, the impartiality of the journalist can be affected. Um, they don't discount enough given the disclosure. They, they never kind of read this, read the disclosure and go, oh, well, in that case, I'm not going to take this, the article quite as seriously. That's not a sort of bit of mental mathematics that they actually do. So I'm not a huge fan of disclosures as a, as a sort of solution for this problem. Uh, let me, can I just jump in there a bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I don't think that if you're doing something unethical and you disclose it, that makes it okay. Um, what I was talking about, <laughs> what I was talking about w really was differentiating, um, you know, an advertisement from a piece of editorial. That's, that's a and point. there, I think, you know, a piece of labeling that says paid post or, you know, this is an ad. I mean, even if you say it in a little softer, blurrier way, that that's the kind of disclosure I think can be, but, but can be you know, useful. I have spent a long time, for instance, going back and forth with Henry Blodgett of Business Insider about he has this wonderful distinction between sponsor content and sponsored content, <laughs> um, which w one of them is editorial and one of them is advertising, and I defy you to say. work out which is which. <laughs> but it's, you know, it, and, and in a sense, you know, if you have an advertising supported publication, all of your content is sponsored content. All of your content is kind of presented at, you know, only because the sponsors are buying advertising. Um, you know, and then sponsor content labeled as such just means that this particular content only really lives next to this particular advertiser. Is that so bad? No, but you know, there are gradations here and as I say, trying to make sure that the reader really understands the gradations and who's in charge and whether there's veto power and that kind of thing, it gets really messy, very, very murky very quickly. My phone is Godspeed, so they have their guidelines which they introduced in January. And then three months later, the editor in chief just ignored them and deleted two posts. But he apologized. <laughs> <laughs> he did. And actually, so that's the difference. Yeah, he said so. I mean, that, the, one of the differences we were talking earlier, uh, George and Bill, um, the Buzzfeed, the reaction to the Buzzfeed deletions, within 24 hours, the editor in chief had put back up those posts, which were critical of two advertisers with a, a, a chunky statement saying these were removed in error. Well, what, what that illustrates, Jane, surely, is the, is the value of transparency in conjunction with competition. Felix is quite right to point out that transparency on its own only gets you so far. I think it's a good minimum to label advertising, editorial, and so on. Labeling gives you some navigational information. It may not give you everything you need to know. But if you label something, and you've got a lot of competitors and opponents out there who are going to jump on you the second your own proclaimed standards have been bust, everybody will know about it. Mm -hmm. And can I just connect that to another point, that if we are in a world now in which journalism has been consumed much, much more in fragments, actually establishing the integrity of the brand is going to become, and I mean brand in the proper this is something you can rely on sense, is going to become a more complex and difficult business and maybe even require harder defense than it has had before. Mm -hmm. Because if most of your stuff is going to be consumed in individual items which can fly around a liquid torrent of information which can go anywhere, then you don't have the kind of, this is the basic serious bundle of integrity here, every single bit has got to carry that mark. But I mean, that we talked um, the other day about the fact that with BuzzFeed, for example, it's a good example because the, the 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 ones that were deleted were on the thing called Life, which is you know we typically know it as the cat listicle area, whereas BuzzFeed News is perhaps where they were really trying to check the editorial integrity that the rules weren't being breached. And it's hard, isn't it, if you are suddenly publishing? It's not just one print product a day. 
if you're publishing hundreds and hundreds of pieces with millions of page views, that, that becomes a, a huge task, doesn't it? Much bigger task. It, it evolves some of the most boring things that you can ever discuss in a newsroom. Organization, hierarchy, self-discipline, rules, enforcement of, you want me to go on, you don't want me to go on. <laughs> it matter, all those things matter a lot. Guidelines. Right. And, and that's exactly why you know, they created this distinction between BuzzFeed News and BuzzFeed Life, right? Because you don't need those rules and standards and whatnot for cat listicles. And so they said, okay, we're going to create this like standards light area for like very fast, repetitive cat listicles because it, it would be a waste of money and everybody's time to make them go through, jump through those hoops. And then basically what they found was, oops, we've managed to publish journalism by mistake in the area which was designed for cat listicles. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, generally, I think we should, uh, just to be, be an old guy and therefore give a historical view, I think we should just take a view of the evolution, at least in the, uh, the Anglo-American media, that actually this situation has got a lot better compared with 20, 30, 40 years ago, I think, um, in terms of the ethics, in terms of the clarity, in terms of that separation. Now, we are in a transitional period in which, for some organizations, the power of an advertiser may have got larger because, if you like, a large organization has become a small one, and to use George's point, that suddenly you become more dependent. Um, but let's move on and look at the future. What is it going to be in, the, in a digital first world? Um, I would say that the good news as journalists is that the reader now matters much more because we lost on advertising anyway. Basically, <laughs> that's kind of dead, or not dead, but um, diminished anyway, dying probably, diminished. So everything is about the relationship to the reader. To the, cu to the customer. So you as a journalist are going to increasingly, and as a whatever you call a, a news organization, uh, a media organization, you're gonna have to think about what is it, what promise am I making? Why, and I think this is a basic question that we should all have been asking ourselves for donkey's years, why should anyone pay me or ask me to do this for them? That's a basic question of journalism. What value have I added compared with George just doing this himself on the internet? or you know, Meg just doing it herself, or, or watching another, or you know, looking at another feed. Um, so that question is gonna be there. So then the value of, of the ethics surely does increase. So I, I'd say the good news is that this, this problem should go away to some extent, or at least if, we, if it doesn't go away, we haven't done our jobs. It, it doesn't seem to be going away though, does it? I mean, I, just no. hearing you speak, one of the most interesting and most difficult areas should be business journalism. Because there you've got, you know, journalists who are working at the forefront of dealing with big organisations, writing about them every day in sometimes critical ways. How, if, and again, I hark back to the Telegraph, what, what that showed was if an organisation is desperate to keep its advertising money and its relationships going, it will stop business journalism in the future. It will stop it. I mean, you, and and, and I mean the classic example in the US about a, a year, two years ago was um, this big controversy over a, a bunch of Bloomberg articles about China where, you know, Bloomberg has seen um, significant drop off in subscriber growth. They know that the future of their business is increased subscriber growth specifically from China because they can't get it any, anywhere else. They're saturated everywhere else. They really, really, really want to grow in China, and they know that if they publish articles critical of, of, of China and start talking about nepotism and all of this kind of stuff, then they will not be allowed to do that. And so they wound up effectively censoring themselves for that reason. You know, do you consider the entire Chinese government to be an advertiser? But it's all the, you know, it's all basically the same issue. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing about that is that uh, in China, both the New York Times and the Bloomberg sites have been blocked because Bloomberg did do a huge and very powerful and very good series, uh, you know, digging into uh, the wealth of people associated with the Chinese government. Um, and, and so, you know, there was such, it was shocking really to see some statements in which they said they would 
back off from that. It's also been interesting to see Bloomberg say, or a, an editor for Bloomberg say, we don't co we're not going to try to cover ourselves. Um, that, that's, yeah. that that's just, <laughs> it can't be done easily. And, you know, I mean, it, 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 I guess that's, I guess I think that news organizations do have to rise above those kinds of things and do their best to cover themselves, to cover their competitors, to cover difficult organizations and advertisers. I mean, you have to try. I, sp I mean, I, I can't help but bring this in. Uh, George, obviously, if we're talking about China and ownership issues, obviously, Rupert Murdoch's own ambitions in China were responsible for things like blocking the book by Chris Patton at one point, which he must have been there at the time, I think. I was at the Times at the time, yeah. yeah. The it was a book publication. I mean, how, I suppose, uh, you know, to, to Bill's point about Italy, you know, we, it, is it these issues of ownership are just as bad as the sort of commercial department trying to make you write puff pieces, if I, not worse? I cert well, I certainly wouldn't say so. Different people will have different experiences. But again, I really do think that transparency and competition, I'm, I'm really echoing Bill's point here, has changed this a great deal. Yeah. Um, Murdoch killed the publication of a book by Chris Patton the publishers took the story to Daily Telegraph, I think, if I remember rightly. Um, and, I mean, they filled on day one three pages with it, I think. I mean, the damage done by those three pages, never mind, you know, the three columns the next day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for several weeks, must have, I would have thought, just in News Corp's narrow interest calculations, have been a minor catastrophe. I mean, they got nowhere in China in the end, absolutely nowhere. Mm. So all that kind of attempted kowtowing didn't help, didn't work. Um, and reputationally, it was a disaster. Yeah. So calculations about this kind of thing change, and on the whole, I think they change broadly, not uniformly, but broadly, in favor of transparency driven, driven by competition. Can I... Can I just do a shout out, because somebody mentioned Bloomberg, can I just do a shout out for um, agencies and particularly Reuters here? Reuters have difficulty with their business model, but it doesn't rely on advertising. Felix probably wants to come back on this. <laughs> but it doesn't rely on advertising. And some of the most remarkable multinational investigative journalism done in the last two years has been done by the enterprise team at Reuters. If anybody doubts this, look up the assets of the Ayatollahs. You can literally look it up under that phrase. I mean, multi-center, multi-reporter, huge thing about the inner finances of some of the most powerful people in Iran. People can't, people, Iranian reporters at Reuters can't now go back home, probably, possibly ever, or certainly the duration of this regime. People have had to move, and so on and so forth. So uh, is it a coincidence that an organization not dependent on advertising is finding that it, it may be, it may just be a key individual or group of individuals. Yeah, but no, it's I very, the results are very striking. I would say yes, it's a coincidence. I mean, much as I love Mike Williams and his investigative group at Reuters, and they really do do amazing stuff, um, they do what, you know, well-resourced investigative groups do. And I can't imagine that if his group was at an advertiser-supported um, publication that, you know, they would have done something different. I think that maybe the difference with Reuters is that they are more global in their outlook. And so you're going to find, you know, hard-hitting investigations about China and Iran rather than about domestic issues because virtually all other um, independent media organizations are national rather than international. And so you need the international organizations to go after places like China and Iran where there isn't a domestic press which will do that. So I think, I think really it's more a function of the fact that it's global than it is a function of the fact that it's not advertised Yeah, I, th I think that's probably a fair point. Yep. Yeah. I mean, on that issue, obviously the, more and more organizations are becoming global, which makes big news. Well, I think there are lots of <laughs> I think the Economist, <laughs> the, the Economist and the Guardian, obviously, as well as the Times, is trying to become more, more global. It, but it does make... Um, monitoring and more of an issue, again, this point. Margaret, there was, there was a piece written, I think it was by Jack Schaefer, about, you know, is, is there any future role for a public ombudsman? 
And one, one, one of the things I found really interesting... <laughs> well, one of the things I found interesting about the... I think he said that, was he? Uh, about Ben Smith is that there you had the editor-in-chief directly reinstating the post right on Twitter saying this is why we did it. Yeah. Is that feasible? I mean, is that, what, is that the model or should we be having... BuzzFeed should have somebody like you to do it. As long as it's not me. <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, I think that if you have editors who are very responsive to the public um, at, at different levels, then uh, it does reduce the need for you know, an independent voice. And I also think there are many, many voices out there now who are, you know, there are uh, let a thousand ombudsmen bloom. You know, it's, uh, there's a ton of people out there who are, who are willing to comment. I think the thing that I can do and that public editors can do is to actually get an answer internally and to sort of process it. You're processing the outside criticism. You're getting some answers from the inside because they have to talk to you because they pay you. And so, uh, and then trying to make some sense of it. I, I don't know that you can necessarily get that in Bu another Buzzfeed way. BuzzFeed is the last place you need it. I mean, what, what Margaret does is, is she listens to the criticis criticisms coming from the readers and then she gets the editors to respond to those criticisms. Um, this is something which happens every day directly at BuzzFeed. And when this issue has been brought up in the past, Ben Smith has said, you know, our public editor is, is Shani Hilton. You know, she does a great job. Who's, who's, she's, she's just a, an editor, a very senior editor at BuzzFeed. And when you have people like that who are just constantly focused on their audience and what people are saying and engaging, then the need for this kind of om ombudsman role does largely um, dissipate. On the other hand, if you know, I can pick on myself here because it's easier. You know, if you work for Disney, then, you know, there is this much more of a culture of, like, we need to control communications and there are certain things that you can say and certain things that you can't say. And the more that, you know, there's a sort of self-censorship in, in terms of what reporters feel comfortably, comfortable saying publicly, the more role you have for the ombudsman. I have tried many times to get New York Times reporters to say something to me on the record about this or that or the other, and they always say, oh, no, I'm not allowed to. And so in those situations, um, you know, that's where someone like Margaret becomes in incredibly useful. I, I think it is useful in at least some newsrooms, maybe not all of them, for there to be some countervailing power to the big, powerful desks. If somebody has done something which turns out to be in the course of reporting, which turns out to be controversial, the odds are in any organization consisting of human beings that the desk to which they report will, will back them up at least to start with. Now in certain circumstances, it's not a bad idea to have somebody who reports only to the editor or the editor in chief, whatever they're calling it, who can go in and say, did this actually happen as claimed? You know, you don't, you don't need an enormously formally separated power, necessarily, but you need someone who is not going to just accept the first explanation. Because, alas, occasionally things do go wrong. First explanations are not always true. You know, some, lots of news organizations ha who don't have a public editor or ombudsman do have an internal standards editor, you know, who, who isn't as public facing but still has the role that you just described. I mean, can we talk a little bit about one of the issues that I, I think is interesting about um, changes, which, you know, it's always happened that you've been able to um, edit something that was wrong. But of course, what used to happen was you get something wrong in print and then somebody writes in and says that's wrong and then there's a correction the next day. Now what, what can happen is an editor can just go in and change it and just nobody will ever know. And one of the things about transparency, and that could be a spelling from a spelling mistake to a complete change in a quote or actually a verb. It, lots of places, I mean, I, I've actually, when I said that every time we made a substantive change like that at The Guardian, we had to endnote it to say we have changed this, you know, to, to change the meaning. Somebody, another newspaper in the UK, um, they laughed. I mean, we can all think of certain papers that would not change, you know, notify any significant change like that, would just bury the story and nobody would ever find it again. Is that something that should be more serious? You know, that 
that sort of change without transparency. I'll, I'll jump in here to say that I think when there's a factual error that's corrected, that ought to be noted. I don't think that you can track down every change that's made in a mm. story as it's in an evolving news yeah. story particularly. It's ridiculous and it would be onerous, but I think if you're saying something, uh, you know, was wrong and you've corrected it, you know, you've got to tell your readers that. This, this is where we, we, th we start talking about Vox and stock versus flow journalism. Um, you know, historically journalism has been about, you know, starting with a blank sheet and creating something new, um, which is a kind of silly model online because, you know, the, you, there is no physical product or newscast which gets delivered to you. Um, and so one of the things which Ezra wants to do at Vox.com is, is create these living stories, not just for the breaking news events that Margaret is talking about, but for everything, that you, know, you just write one story and you update it and you make sure it's correct and it just changes over time. Um, and you know, those edits are typically not going to be factual corrections, but they're just going to be, we're going to make the story better and more up to date. And, and um, in those circumstances, especially when you have inbound links and people are quoting you and people then follow those links and they say, well, I don't see it anymore. Um, absolutely, there's a very strong case for having some kind of Wikipedia style editing history built into the CMS so that someone who really cares can see what happens. Well, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. No, and as far as I know, I mean, apart from like a couple of, you know, Wiki News experiments, it's n no one's kind of nailed that, but I know that Ezra wants it. And surely the right, if for the po from the point of view of what promise have you made to the reader, um, the right principle would be if it's just updating improvement, as Felix says, you know, something new has happened, there's no reason to say, you just put a, another date on it. But if you got something factually wrong or you know, misquoted or something in the previous version, then you have a, a duty to the readers who saw that to give them an opportunity to know that, that this was wrong. So it's, it's just, I think it's a distinction between those things. If it's a, a, the flow of, of new information, then it's boring. But gets in, in the way. And that's exactly the time, a correction might just get the word corrected at the foot of the story, and you can click on the link if you really want to know the detail. <coughs> it might evolve. And as Margaret says, if, 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 it's, if it's a word that matters, if it changes, if it makes substantive points, then it should be noted. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I, I, I do want to ask the audience to um, come in with questions, but I suppose finally, and I, you know, thinking about the Telegraph and BuzzFeed, they were my two sort of yin and yang in this, uh, uh, in this area. It, it seems to me though, it, from everything that we've talked about, it's too facile, if we're looking at the future, to say that the old, the, the sort of print mainstream media that are struggling with declining revenues and keep harking back to the past are the ones is it, or is it too facile to say that they are the ones that are struggling, it's sort of old versus new, with the response to this, these challenges? Or actually is the definition good versus bad? I mean, what, you know, is this a sort of a marker of success in the digital age? No, this, this is a mission thing, and this goes back to what Bill was saying about independent journalism. Um, you know, BuzzFeed en ultimately ended up reacting the right way because both the editor-in-chief and the CEO care about these issues. Um, the Telegraph bollocks it all up massively because they didn't even really have an editor-in-chief, they just had a chief content officer, whatever that means, and the owners, you know, don't care. They don't have that mission of providing, you know, great independent journalism. And if your proprietor doesn't care about journalism, um, you know, whether it's the Barclay Brothers or whether it's Silvio Berlusconi, you know, then you are going to have deep ethical issues no matter what. And it's not a question of the business model going away. The Telegraph is minting money, actually. You know, th they're actually fine financially, but they just want more because for the Barclay Brothers, having more money is better than having, you know, independent journalism. And I mean, one should just clarify about this Telegraph story. I absolutely delighted that uh, Peter Oborn published the, uh, the exposure he did, and it was great to see the Telegraph uh, embarrassed in this way. But this was a case of self-censorship. This was a case of not publishing a story which their readers might have expected them to publish. Now, you, 
you could have argued to that by saying, well, okay, our readers could find out about this story from everywhere else. We just decided not to put it in the Daily Telegraph. That's what they did. That's what they did. So you could, in the modern kind of, if you like, in the, in the digital world, say, well, actually, maybe that's the future. Maybe you, you would just say, okay, we won't publish these embarrassing stories about our advertisers. Um, now, I wouldn't defend that. I wouldn't do that as a... As a, as a there editor. should be a little box at the bottom of the front page of every publication saying, here are links to embarrassing stories about our advertisers on other <laughs> side. That's right, exactly. <laughs> but it was that case. It was a self-censorship case. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> so first up with Anne, so have they were their first woman working with uh, well first Jeff. <laughs> first and all. Okay, let's just do one first. Yeah, well, yeah. Which I'm still puzzled for. Which one should you go with? I'm Jeff Jarvis. Um I'm I'm as uncomfortable with the vice vogue exception as I was at a newspaper with the advertorially written car and real estate sections. But perhaps we, we have that. But overall what separates journalism from mere conversation should be our standards. And so you've talked about institutions. I'm concerned about my students and graduates who in the present job market will leave and on Monday they may be writing a journalistic story and on Tuesday they're writing for a brand. And on Wednesday they're writing a journalistic story and so on. When I was in the business, don't I hate saying that like an old guy, <laughs> if someone left the newspaper to go to work in PR, we sat Shiva for them. They had died to us, <laughs> right? You were never allowed back. Um, uh, now, that's just simply not the case. So I'm worried about what's the definition of journalism as a standard if we allow all the crap in institutionally and if our students who are trained as journalists also become shills every other day of the week. Uh, far be it from me to be a purist, but do we need standards for the definition of journalism itself and the definition of, in that sense of journalism? I, I grew up in, in my misspent youth at a magazine in England called Euromoney, which is a very good journalistic um, organization, but boy, did we violate that rule. I mean, we, we had a whole suite of freelancers who one day would be writing a story for the magazine and the next day would be writing an editorial. And somehow we survived. I mean, I'm glad you said that, Is that, that a good thing <laughs> or a bad I don't thing? think Euromoney did that well. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad Jeff has actually brought in PR because none of us have mentioned the fact that one of the biggest pressures is PR. And, and I mean, that, you know, I suppose a lot has been said in the past, but that pressure, I mean, George, you see journalism students, obviously, frequently, as does Margaret at Columbia. Um, is that, how do you sort of deal with that with their, their youth, as I patronisingly call them, the young people? Well, you know, I think you try to, you try to get across what the, highest standards are and hope that some of it sticks. You, you, you don't have to say to them you will want, won't you, to work in the places of the highest standards because you're going to generally assume they do, but you do say to them if you are interning or you're moving around, you really do need to discover what the rules are that are in place before you set finger to keyboard. That's a really, really good idea. Sounds a bit basic, but I've come across enough students who've missed it. Um, and there is quite a high premium now on those kinds of standards being expressed in ways which people can get and digest easily. I mean, I've seen newsrooms or heard of newsrooms where, you know, as it were, the start, and indeed quite a lot of this came out in the Leveson Inquiry in, in Britain, where, you know, no reporter in the newsroom had the faintest idea whether or not the newspaper adhered to what was then the press complaint, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all the codes and so on. Um, it actually is really very important nowadays that people know what it is, can get it quickly, can consult it, because stuff comes up and, as Jeff rightly says, they may be moving around. I, I'm not a big fan of codified standards guides and ethics guides. They, they, it causes people to game the system and say, well, it was within the letter of the law. Like, you know, you, you just say, do the right thing, and if you have any questions, think about it, talk to me, it's, you know, like, yeah. Well, firstly, you can always, in fact, rule number one should be, if you're in any doubt about something ethically and you're not sure, ask. Ask somebody who is supposed to know. That can certainly easily be rule number one. But I disagree if you say that you don't codify anything else. What I'm arguing for is that people codify it really well. And well would include brief, quick, accessible, easy to use, among a lot of other things. I mean, I think this, we could have a whole panel on the issue of regulation, particularly in the UK. 
Um, but I, I do think, I mean, it was interesting that this week, ASME, um, the Society of Magazine Editors, for the first time said it would be okay for journalists and editors to write on advertising features in the magazine industry. When Condé Nast and Hearst and many others, as Jeff was saying yesterday, have been doing this for a long say, time. Where have they been? Where have so, they been? So the sort of rule makers after the horses bolted is uh, is obviously quite a big thing as well. Now there were two, two yeah. people, man there, and then the, the lady in the front, woman in the front. Hi, uh, Jonathan Stein from Project Syndicate. Um, I wonder, uh, you know, we're a very small organization, and 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 I'd like to kind of poke a hole in this distinction between small organizations and large organizations because we actually take a very tough line on this mix between uh, advertising and editorial. And we, um, you know, there are certain cut and dried cases. The Telegraph is an obvious one. Vogue may be, a, a, you know, another one where there, there's transparency. We once had a, a CEO of a major uh, a car company basically contact us and say, I'm going to give you a whole pile of money to give me a monthly column. And we're a very small organization, and we said, absolutely. And 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 the, and you know the P, their PR department would write this column every month, and and the reason is because for us our credibility is simply everything. If this ever got out, we would be we would be dead, especially as a small organization uh, yeah. that has a global presence. You know, th it would just take one case of something like this to really do very very serious damage to us, and so we've stayed away from it. But, you know, although we're very careful about it, and I especially, am, as managing editor, am very, very careful about it, maybe I'm missing something because, you know, you, Felix Salmon, you raised the example of Vice. I think they do dynamite journalism. I think their Ukraine coverage has been phenomenal. I, you know, they, they got inside the Islamic State. They've, they've, I, I don't see where the, the, the line is being crossed. It, so am I missing something or... Or is this really just okay if you do it in a way that's very well concealed? And because if you don't, you don't, you don't, you need, just don't get caught. You don't need to. You don't need to conceal it. You can do it out in the open. So my, my former colleague Dan Roth has done an amazing job doing exactly what you're talking about, which is getting CEOs to um, write fluffy things about themselves yeah. and, and he calls it the LinkedIn Influencers Program and it, it is hugely successful, it's, um, you know, frankly much more successful than Project Syndicate and if you are running a column by the CEO of a car company, no one is going to expect hard hitting journalism on the subject of that car company they're going to expect, you know him to be puffing himself I don't, you know, like you know, obviously I think the reason why you felt so comfortable rejecting that was probably because they offered you lots of money and you're more in the model of we pay people to write for us rather than we have people pay us to write for us. Um, no, no, but no, if you we, look no, at we LinkedIn... Like, we liked money. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> but, but if you look at LinkedIn, you know, um, people really, really love consuming all of that PR written pabulum by quote unquote Richard Branson. No one thinks it's you know independent, but it's hugely popular. Right, is that news though? Is that journalism? It, or, it, or is that simply da Danny would, some would kind call of himself media a journalist. entertainment, yeah. you know, professional development and, and to exercise? The, and, and to your point, yes, absolutely, Vice has done some amazing stuff um, in international journalism. Yes, it's just a tiny minority of their total output. Hi, my name is Anabel Hernandez. I am a Mexican journalist. And what about when the media depends more from the money of the government than the audience? I mean, in, in, in Mexico, almost most the media depends, uh, the mo from the, depends on the money from the government but through advertising, not private advertising. The government pays advertising to the media, and that's one m way to control the media which is the options for the journalists that work inside the media. And sometimes it's very difficult to, to write the stories. Now I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I am an, um, um, uh, freelance, yeah, sorry, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, because it was, I was tired to be censored by the media. But what about this? How to change that model of business? Bill, you've, I mean, the whole issue of government control of uh, newspapers, obviously we, we try to say that it doesn't happen at all, obviously in the UK with the friendships that go on in um, <laughs> the, 
that go on in places like the Cotswolds. But obviously in Italy, it's, I think, much more blatant. That they're well, I think, it's, I think it's a question about competition. I mean, uh, this has always been true of local newspapers in uh, small towns, I mean, where the local council may have a disproportionate amount of the advertising. So it's also true at the level of the Mexican government, and I'm sure there are plenty of countries where, where that is true. And governments, unfortunately, are powerful things which, and they deploy uh, resources, whether they are money or uh, access uh, or um, favors of one kind or another to individuals, they are going to uh, be in danger of distorting the, what, what journalists or what, what uh, independent media organizations try to do. So I think it's a story as unfortunately as old as girl, boy meets girl, uh, and um, uh, we just have to try to keep exposing it and to, and um, the amount of competition is a very vital ingredient of whether or not it becomes a devastating problem or not. Um, there was a, uh, another, <coughs> sorry, my voice is going. There's a, someone right at the back, but there, and then this gentleman here. Hi, I wanted to follow up on the question earlier from, I guess your name is Jeff, and then hear from Jonathan around sort of how the, the money and, and accepting content comes in. Uh, as a freelancer, uh, rates are very low from a lot of publications these days, and rates from advertisers and PR, but also for ghostwriting posts like the CEO columns and things like that are very high. So do you see a way that um, news organizations like this are able to sort of affect some of that by bringing up freelance rates, or even in the case of the travel story with the New York Times, and not accepting um, junkets is such a big barrier, but freelancers are now being asked to pay more of those costs as well, those issues? Well, you know, I think uh, you make a great point. It's very difficult to, to get by as a freelancer whose standards are very high. And um, I mean, it's very hard to get by as a freelancer anyway. It's a, it's a tough way to make a living. And I don't really have the answer. I mean, um, at, at the New York Times, you know, departments were told recently as part of cost cutting measures to actually reduce their freelance budgets, not necessarily reducing the amount one person would get for one article, but just overall probably less, less assigning. So, you know, as, as news organizations that use freelancers try to keep their costs in line, you know, I, I don't think the situation gets any easier. I don't know what the answer is. It's, it's weirdly irrational um, that news organizations, when they are shrinking, and most news organizations are shrinking these days, um, generally cut the freelance budget first. Um, even though these, the full-time staffers are much more expensive and much less productive and you'd be much better off you know, cutting a couple of full-time staffers and using the budget to hire more freelancers and maybe pay them more. Um, and this is also exacerbated by the fact that um, whereas journalism used to be uh, more of a sort of, you know, the, the, the children of the middle classes would become journalists, now we have a much broader um, group of um, people doing journalism, which is fantastic for journalism, but it also means they can't just get, you know, Aunt Agatha to support them anymore. Not in the UK. <laughs> and the UK is a bit different, it's true. Um, but yeah, you, you, you seriously, like, if you want to make it as a freelance journalist these days, then either you sell your soul to PR or you um, inherit your money. And so Vice is quite a good example here as well, though, because the, their freelance bu budget, there's a huge sort of wash of stuff that's white labeling that's native advertising that freelancers are getting paid for but where the awards are going and where vice is sort of trying to promote itself and is obviously working and does amazing stuff a lot of those guys that are going out into isis and going to places and doing those amazing first person videos they're freelancers too so they may not be paid so much but the reputation they're getting the sort of ethics and the values that we're talking about news that's g existing cheek by jowl with this other much more regularly best paid possibly. Can, um, I, can I just say I have a dream. Uh, <laughs> the dream is that it, with the greater exposure of data and information about things that actually one crucial piece of information that readers might get access to is how much 
the journalists are being paid to do different stories. And it would Ooh. seem to me... So that's, that's a radical nightmare. Transparency. I know it's a nightmare. <laughs> However, it would seem to me, and obviously yeah. I've spent a career in a privileged position at a, well, a successful, well-resourced magazine, but it would seem to me that if I as a reader find that the, re that the, the authors of these articles have been paid 50 euros to write this article or you know, something and so on, I would actually think that that, that diminished the value of that, the quality of that to me, whereas I think that the, the bright business model for the future is going to have to be quality. <coughs> it's going to have to be, uh, I invest in maybe a small number of actually rather highly paid people, and that's probably what you're trying to do. Um, so I think a transparency might <laughs> eventually bring my dream to true for some publication. I'm naive like that. <laughs> That's right, though. That's a nice idea. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, talking about n native ad advertising, uh, all of you say that media have to respect some rules. I want to ask you mm, which are these rules, and above all, if there are, if are there, in your opinion, some example, uh, any examples that not respect the these rules? Thank you. Where did I want to come from? Yeah. 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 Um, well, I think. <coughs> I don't know that I can think of an example of, of, of a bad practice, but I think the rules should be that whoever's looking at the content knows what it is. Is it a piece of journalism or is it a piece of advertising? And um, you know, if you're presenting it as journalism, um, then it should be journalism. And if it's actually a paid post, it should be labeled as such. I think just to add to that, it should be entirely clear. I mean, one problem often, I used to have this battle sometimes with proposals for very editorial adverts in The Economist. They would always put up a dummy of this advert and it would use the same typeface as The Economist. Mm -hmm. And you think, no way. But of course that happens in, uh, in, in uh, less fortunate publication. Mm -hmm. So it, the label is, is one thing, but the clarity of at a glance is what mm -hmm. is yeah, important. That, that is one thing. I mean, Philip, that, that has become more difficult to, to tell, where the, 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 the clear labeling. And, and, yeah. and, one and one of the reasons is that we have online many fewer ways to distinguish things than we do in print. Um, everything is all based on the same CMS these days. And this is a problem in editorial alone, that there's no real way of, and Margaret runs into this all, all the time, that there's some fluffy little style story from the style section, which is perfectly fine when it's fluffy in the style section, but then when it gets pulled into the New York Times' CMS, it looks like an important news story, and everyone says, what on earth? And this becomes even worse when you're dealing with um, you know, native advertising, sponsored content, that kind of stuff, because it all winds up going through the CMS, and the way that CMSs work these days is that everything which goes through the CMS more or less looks the same. It just does. And there's no context to it. You know, it's not like the sort of separate section with the different typeface that has, you yeah. know, this comes from the government of whatever it is. It doesn't, it's just another piece that you're picking up wherever you happen to be and it looks the same and feels the same. And, I, and, I th and it's, that's the importance of labeling, but I think that monitoring native advertising and how it works goes beyond the business of labeling. One of the advantages of data is that it is going to be easier now, or is easier now, to compare over time somebody who does a lot of native, a, a client that does a lot of native advertising and or advertising in a publication, and then over the same period of time how the coverage goes. Because if you're talking about a very big company, I mean, Jen, I think, was suggesting that they'd have to stop business journalism, if you see what I mean. But uh, a very, you know, very large, let's take a British example, um, British Petroleum, let's say. Now, British Petroleum takes native advertising in some new online service. Somebody is going to need to monitor what kind of native advertising there is, what kind of advertising there is, and what kind of coverage it does over BP. Now, it may take you two years to really see the answer. Uh, but actually that measurement, that over time measurement, is quality measurement is going to be really important. Isn't it, I mean, just before leaving the, the native advertising point, what's really interesting is that the companies themselves have become much, advertisers have become much more aggressive in saying, why should we put an ad in your paper? We could go to Vice, unless you give us something that looks like one of your esteemed journalists has written about us in a positive way. 
and increasingly, I mean, Bill, you know, you saying you're not having this, it looks the same as editorial. It's increasingly hard to tell in lots of organisations. <coughs> That's yeah, and I think that you have to be, you know, I think that organisations that value their own credibility and their relationships with their readers have to be willing to say no to that. Hello, my name is Simone Spezia. I work uh, for a radio owned by Sole 24 Ore Group. <coughs> uh, the point about transparency is very interesting for me because transparency itself generates a form of competition. Uh, but what, I, what I'd like to understand is how do you think we should apply transparency to our daily work? I mean, should we write something like uh, HSBC is a regular advertiser of this newspaper or something like this? I mean, I mean, for me, it would be much more difficult because it's about, in a radio, it's a 10 or 15 percent of my, of my article. But I would like to know uh, what do you think, how, how we can apply this in our daily work? One, one of the things I have is a podcast. Um, called Slate Money and it comes with sponsors and the way that podcasts work is in is pretty much exactly the same as um, old-fashioned radio shows and it's very anathema to people like me who come from print which is that the host me like you know starts reading like glowing copy about you know Dropbox or Automatic or um, Casper mattresses and um, and it's it's a it's a very weird feeling but what you're saying is absolutely right. It does bring complete transparency to the whole process. I'm not pretending that I'm not being paid by these guys because clearly I am. I'm like, you know, I'm chilling for them and I have to, and, and I, the, you know, I do have veto power. If it's someone who I don't believe in, I won't do it. But yeah, I think it's, it's, it feels uncomfortable, but maybe it's a way to go. If I might just add on that, I mean, I think it, it does depend, I think you have to think about what is it your, your listeners are expecting. I mean, everyone knows that Insole 24 Ore is owned by Confindustria, so they don't expect it to be, as it were, independent from Italian business, big business in general, but what do they expect? And so that, that has to be, you know, the basic question you ask yourself. You couldn't, since most of the people that you talk about will be advertisers, <laughs> you couldn't say in every case. So it's a question of what, what Yes. But but do you, I think the question to ask yourself is, do you think the, re the viewer would, would think differently about what you're saying if, the, if, the, if you disclosed something to them? If, if it makes no difference, there's no reason to disclose it. But it's rather like the question that Meg was talking about, about not covering yourself. I mean, the Bloomberg not writing about itself. Well, w we, we used to have a, a, a rule at The Economist that we we basically didn't write about Pearson, which were a 50% shareholder, or the Financial Times, who own us through that, not because we were not willing to write about them, of course, in an extreme case we would, but because we thought the reader wouldn't really think that it was totally independent if we wrote about our own owner um, uh, in this way, and therefore they wouldn't value it in the same way as if we were writing about Bloomberg. But obviously it, 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 there are, extreme cases when you'd need to do it. I mean, I just, I'd like to add on that, that, it, you know, covering media obviously is quite an interesting yeah. example. In the UK, for example, there's only The Guardian and The Independent. The Times does still have a media editor, which uh, is quite a, a challenging role. I think we can all agree. Um, but the rest of the newspapers think that somehow it's a, about, you know, washing your dirty linen in public, that it's a, a, a foolish task that you should even be having these discussions about what papers, what journalists are doing, because that's somehow invalid. Um, were there any more questions from the floor? Has any, anyone else got their hand up? This person. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm sorry if this sounds really, really naive, so I apologize in advance, but. Um, I was listening to a, a podcast yesterday, and it was about the history of Rome. And at the end of the podcast, the presenter just said, um, I've been offered some money to put adverts in this, uh, but we're all in this together, so send me an email and let me know what you think. 
Now, what I know is that we're, everyone in this room, we're all in too deep to predict what most readers probably think about what we do. But what do you think would happen if we introduced an element of consultation and we ask people what they thought of the kind of decisions that we're making, appeal to readers for their opinions? And it wasn't a crowdsourced podcast? What was the podcast? Uh, no, not at all. It was just a, it was like an amateur thing that a historian was doing in his own time. Oh, that's um, I know we can't apply that to the kind of things we do, but um, I just think it's interesting because I think everybody who heard that would have thought, oh yeah, of course, take the money, good for you. And he got about a thousand emails saying, yeah, take the money. And I think there would be a lot more goodwill and less suspicion and less cynicism if we just explained to people uh, better why we're in trouble and what they could do for us. And I think the public would back us, I think. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I think you're right that the people who would respond to that to that question would probably say, go ahead and take the money. But I don't think that that's, um, uh, it would be representative of the whole. And even if it were representative of the whole, I don't think you can actually outsource that kind of judgment. Mm. Yeah. And, and I, th I think as, as we've all said, if he does take the, or I think we all agree that he's talking about takes the money, then I think there should be a lot of transparency about where that money comes from. And he'll have to do the embarrassing Felix this is brought to you from a mattress company. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no other questions from the floor, no, it's just saying that obviously we've had a brilliant discussion. Um, and it's been a really, really brilliant discussion because we have such great people and you've been great in the audience as well. So um, just as a final point, I think um, we're all in agreement. I feel actually more positive about the future, having sat here and listened. <laughs> Um, having felt terribly negative about uh, the consequences of what was going on. Um, I think transparency is going to be key. And I would just like you finally to say thank you to a great panel, Felix Salmon, Margaret Sullivan, Phil Emmett and George Brock. Thank you very much. to meet you, yes. Yes, yeah, he told me that you were, some of you were going to be here. Thank you. Oh, do you? Oh, okay, very good. That may be rather than a boring panel. Of course, of course. Those are my things. No, Hi. Yes, okay. Yes. That's a, yeah, terrific. It's a rule of the universe. I do, yes, I do. Maybe once or twice a month. The thing is, the jokes don't um, translate, which is really hard. You, I mean, sometimes about, it's maybe usually about international affairs. Yeah. Yes. Jeff Jarvis is going to join us. Uh, yeah. Advocacy. Yeah, I don't know whether, I mean, I don't, my, my recollection is that place campaign. doesn't actually keep so reservations, but maybe I'll try to wander down Italy, there. Do you know where I'm talking? It, it, we European passed Union. it on our way to our uh, panel this morning. It's right down after the stairs, it's around the corner, and it's close. Uh, so I'll see if they'll, uh, so it would be like, what, 7.35 or something. Ah, did you? Oh, no, 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 absolutely. Yeah, we'll say 730. Yeah. Okay, fine. So, I'll, I'll, the great I'll, European yeah, because yeah, I'm a little bit afraid we walk in there and they're like, oh, we don't have a table.